So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me in my session, Developing Solutions for Everyone. My name's Alex Mackey, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how we can develop solutions that will work for as many people as possible. I'm from Melbourne in Australia. I was originally from the UK, but I've been living in Australia about 10 years or so. I work as a principal consultant um, for an organization called Redify based in Australia. Um, I've been involved predominantly with .NET and web development, and I've also done a bit of work with Cloud Guru. And there's a conference we run over in Australia called DDD Melbourne. Now this is a bit of a different talk for me because normally when I do talks, it's about a bit of a technical subject. This contains some stuff I wanted to share with you and some things that I found useful. Before we begin, I just want to give you this notice here. There's a couple of topics here which can be quite sensitive that I'm going to be touching on today. So if any one of these is a, a particularly sensitive topic or area for you, um, then I really won't be offended if you want to go attend another session. The real world is messy and complex. And when we go and develop systems, we simplify it. We really have to. The world is very complicated. But unfortunately, when we do this during the creation of our systems, sometimes this can result in additional friction for some of the people making use of our systems. Sometimes we can go about reinforcing status quo or how things are, not necessarily how they should be. And sometimes, unfortunately, we can even support or enable bad behavior via the solutions that we create. Dieter Rams, who is a famous industrial engineer who worked for Braun, he said that indifference towards people and the reality in which they live is actually the one and only cardinal sin in design. Today, we're going to be talking about making solutions work for everyone. And I guess I started becoming interested in this area by my own experiences. A bit about me. I'm male. I'm between 35 and 40. I'm white. I'm educated. English is my native language. And I'm married. And this makes me probably part of one of the most privileged groups at the moment. And by and large, the majority of systems and solutions are developed probably more than likely by people similar to me and for people similar to me. And it wasn't until my relationship ended that I started noticing that maybe some things hadn't been quite thought through properly. And one of my first experiences of this was by my daughter's uh, ballet class. And it always used to be my ex-wife who'd go take her to ballet. And it came to the end of term and I was handed a form to go and renew the next, um, the next set of terms fees. And at the top of the form, it said name of mother. It didn't say parent or parent of child or something, it said name of mother. And I laughed when I read this because I thought this was strange. And I looked around and then I realized, actually, I was one of the only dads at this event. And I thought, ooh, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't one for me to be attending. And I next encountered something like this in shopping center. So my children are fairly young, they're three and four now. And we see these sort of signs everywhere. I don't know what it's like in Norway so much, but Australia, you'll get kind of this sort of sign here. And there's this indication that it's a sort of expectation that it's a woman that's going to be changing the child here. And as a single dad, if you go take your kid in here, sometimes, um, not always, but sometimes you can have a bit of an experience that the people in there, they don't really want you in there as a guy. Maybe they're in there breastfeeding their child. You're not really wanted there. Here's another experience. I don't know if you have these in uh, Norway. I took uh, my kids to McDonald's and please don't judge my parenting decisions here. And McDonald's, they've got these big screens and what they want to do is when you're actually ordering your meals, you go and use these screens. And I think one of the reasons they do this is so that they can adjust and tweak prices and promote things. So if, for example, on a hot day, uh, they might promote ice cream or they might even raise the price of their ice cream. And I don't know if you've tried um, maneuvering a three and a four year old on your own, um, but they don't like to wait for things. And trying to order on this screen really didn't work for me in that situation. And I found this quite bizarre because surely families or young families are you know, one of McDonald's bigger groups um, that they'd be working with. And for me, all of these things, they're not huge issues but they're kind of like these little tiny sort of microaggressions that just make your life maybe a little bit harder than it needs to be. 
And all of these things can add up um, to create enormous friction. Now, I'm going to be talking about some bigger issues than some of these. And these are you know, not massive issues. This is you know, all, all uh, circumventable. But it turns out this stuff is everywhere. There's an organization in Australia, and it's a government organization called Centrelink. And Centrelink are responsible um, for doing things like if you're out of work, um, paying money, um, if you need support for illness, and so on. And also if you need um, every, every parent, unless you're very, very rich, will receive some kind of payment rebate. There's another organization called Medicare, which as you might expect, is responsible for reimbursing some of healthcare costs. Now these two organizations have incredibly difficult to use systems. And I'm pretty sure there's certainly people that are gonna struggle more than I will um, in order to go and make their claims and apply for these type of things. And the trouble is that our failure to understand and look at the different types of people using some of these systems is that these systems are failing some of the most vulnerable members of our society. But why? Well, I don't think this is necessarily a male thing or a female thing. I think it's because as human beings, we tend to assume that everyone is like us and we have difficulty sort of understanding that people have different perceptions and way of doing things. I don't think you need to travel too much to go and see this. While there might be some commonalities among us as human beings, there's all these slight differences. Maybe Norwegians prefer a certain type of breakfast over Swedes. There's all these like subtle, subtle things, let alone until you get into the bigger stuff. Now, some of this stuff can have really serious consequences. So a University of Virginia study found that seatbelts put women at a 47 to 71% higher risk of serious injury when compared to men. And it wasn't until the 2008 that the US Department of Transportation actually updated their standards, which ensured um, that manufacturers would use female dummies. That's scary. And the thing is, is that when we're developing systems and solutions, that your biases and blind spots go into this system. And guess what? This produces a bias system with your blind spots. Some good news. As developers and designers, we're in a really great position to go and change this. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. What am I going to be talking about? I want to cover some form designs and tweaks. These are very easy but subtle things that can make a difference that we can do. I'm going to cover some so-called edge cases, or perhaps more accurately, examples where edge cases haven't been um, considered properly. I'm going to talk about algorithms, preventing abuse, and finally, some tools you can do um, that can help you um, with this type of thing. Form design and defaults. I think it's very common when we go and develop lots of different types of applications that will go and request this type of information, such as salutation, title, name, gender, religion, maybe, nationality. And it's very common um, in any type of public facing or even internal web application to ask these type of things. And you've really got to ask why we're asking some of these type of things. So does your system really need to understand the gender of the someone signing up? I'd really question whether you need to understand their religion or indeed their nationality. And I think the reason um, this is asked more often than not is to do with marketing because marketing people love to go and segregate all these users and customers and understand some of the data better. There's a bit of a trend. I was looking at uh, several large sites, and I think this was quite a nice example. This is an Australian site called Domain. It goes and rents and sells various houses. Their sign-up form consists of two fields, an email address and a password. And they realized that's all they actually really need for you to go and use their service. If you'd gone back probably, I don't know, three, four years, I don't know, um, you probably wouldn't have found that the case. And you find there was a lot more collection of information. So my first principle is don't ask for data that you don't need. This could actually have a really dangerous effect and we don't need to travel too far from here in the current day and age for some of this data such as nationality and religion to be really dangerous and have very serious consequences um, for people. And unfortunately, sometimes these systems get hacked and breached and this information can be publicized. There are occasions though where you are gonna need to ask for this data. 
if you're developing some kind of system for healthcare, I think you're probably going to need to understand the gender, the biological gender um, of someone. And in that case, what I'd suggest you do is you go and ask them, and sorry, you go and explain why you will be using this data. I think you're also a lot likely to get people completing this properly if you go and uh, provide some information about how you're going to use it and why it's needed. These are very trivial things to implement. And if you get to this and you're struggling to um, put together a reason why you're asking for this data, then maybe you shouldn't be asking for it. So if you do need data, explain why and what you're going to do with it. I think there can be a tendency, and I've done this myself, to ensure that certain data is binary in nature. Gender is one of these. Now, this can be a bit of a controversial subject for some people, but what I will say is I can absolutely assure you there are definitely people that do not believe, myself included, that this is necessarily a binary field. And we need to support this. This is Facebook's example of how they handle this particular scenario. It's not that complicated to implement this stuff, and it can make a massive difference to people in these groups that they can express themselves how they feel about themselves. So don't assume that some of these things are binary in nature. They're certainly not. Here's a form for a large bank um, in Australia. Um, they're called ANZ. And if you go to sign up for ANZ, um, I took this probably about four or five months ago, You'll see here um, at the top there, there's a fairly standard Mr, Mrs, Miss, Mrs. That's not going to work for everyone. And one prefix that some of the transgender community like is this MX prefix there. And that's used by transgender people um, or those who do not identify with a particular gender. I looked at the Australian census data and in 2016, they estimated there was around 10,000 transgender people, but this is very likely to be underreported. So it could really be double or even triple that. How much effort is it to add this additional field on your form? Or do you even really need to be asking this? Why do we need this salutation or title on our sign up form or our contact form? We probably don't. I found um, an example which really puzzled me as it was just so incredibly stupid. So this is a uh, locker in a gym system. And there was a lady, she signed up for the gym. And then she went to um, the locker to go and put her stuff in, and she found that the locker would not work. And she was really puzzled, why, why can't I get into my locker? And they did a bit of investigation to this, and they discovered that the system had been designed in such a way that she was a doctor, she had signed up as a doctor in the uh, gym's um, admin system, that the system automatically assigned all doctors to the male changing room. Really? Who on earth would design a system like that? But this stuff exists. This is not too long ago. We get um, a checkout form here. And it have a fairly sort of standard first name, last name, company, email address, and address. And you'll find a lot of um, sites and applications will take a very similar approach to this. This doesn't work so well for many people. Let's look at some other examples of names. Now, the W3 have a really great um, page on uh, various details, actually, and this particular one's on names. And you can see that various different parts of the world, they don't have this first name, last name format. And how personal um, to uh, someone is your name? If you can't sign up for a system with your very name, that kind of puts you off it. That's not a good thing. We have the Arabic form um, here. And um, it kind of has a hierarchy, which explains um, some of the relationships. Or maybe um, an Indian name or an Icelandic. And there are literally hundreds of thousands more um, connotations of these. So that first name, last name, split and structure, that's really not going to work for an awful lot of people. And our solutions and applications, they're no longer just local. And even locally, there's people of all nationalities and backgrounds. It's not going to work for. Uh, this was a guy called Shane. and. Uh, he attempted to sign up to Facebook, and he has Native American ancestry, and his name is Shane Creeping Bear. And Facebook flagged his name as invalid and stopped him signing up to this. Now, 
Shane can't sign up and use, you know, this application. It's it's not going to work for Shane. And this is just a tiny taste of the complexity. So what do I suggest we do? Well, first of all, recognize that names are complex. I don't think you could possibly design a you know system that's going to encompass all of that um, complexity there. But what I suggest you do is just ask for the full name. And then you perhaps ask for the user how they want to be referred to. So for example, my full name, legal name is Alexander, but there's no one in the world, including my parents, that actually calls me that. I'm Alex or Al. So I might have full name as Alexander if it needs some kind of legal connotation there. And how do you want to refer to me? And you've then got the flexibility of both options there. Addresses are another example of this. Um, I come across this because my family's all based in the UK and I live in Australia. And sometimes I want to send gifts or something back or a birthday, a Christmas present or something. And you'll get to some of the ordering forms and it will ask you your billing address, but it won't quite fit with the Australian format and way of doing things. And in a global world, if we want people to be able to go and use and order stuff from our products, then we need to be able to support all sorts of different formats. I've just picked three here that I'm familiar with. What about something like that? I don't know if this is going to work for everything. And sometimes you're going to have integrations uh, with external systems, logistic systems that maybe you're going to need it broken down. Maybe, I'm not sure. But I do think the principle is be careful with restrictions that you put in your application, whether it's things that are going to stop um, Shane signing up to your, your service, whether it's addresses or names, be really careful with them. Used well, um, we can they can help ensure data validity um, and uh, correct mistakes. But unfortunately, they can also stop some people using our systems and solutions. Let's talk about defaults. Now, defaults could be considered something of a type of nudge. And there's a great book on this called Nudge. And what a nudge is, um, is a nudge is something that alters people's behavior in a predictable way, but without forbidding options or significantly changing their economic incentives. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's take the example of encouraging healthy eating. Something we should all probably do, but left to my own devices, if I go in and I go and have a look in a canteen, what's available, I'm probably gonna go for something like that over the sort of salad and vegetables. And I suspect many of us um, would make similar choices. So an example of a nudge might be putting all the healthy stuff at eye level, because you're more likely to go and look at it. Um, but if you were to outright ban junk food, that's not a nudge because you've taken away that choice there. So, so someone no longer has the opportunity to go and choose that burger um, if they want to. Little bit of a tangent, but I was particularly amused by this nudge. Now, some of you might have seen these things. And this is a, um, it's not a real fly there, it's a sticker of a fly. And what this company found was that by creating these little stickers of a flies and putting them in men's urinals around the place, it actually encouraged men to pee in the urinals. And they found, and I'm really not sure how this was measured, an 80% reduction of we on the floor because all the men would go and try and pee on this sticker of a fly. It's a very easy thing to implement. And uh, whilst it doesn't take away your choice of win on the floor, which is a bit weird, um, you can see that it makes a difference. Defaults can have a very real impact um, on, uh, on our societies. So example, in the case of um, organ donors, um, it's quite common when you sign up for your driver's license to be asked the question of, do you want to go and donate um, your organs in the event of an accident? Um, in the US, uh, about 40% of people um, are registered as organ donors. In Spain, Portugal, and Austria, it's 99%. And that's probably partly because they changed the default on the sign-up form to be, yes, I do want to go and register for my organs to be donated. We find similar things um, if we look at sort of savings plans. And this was uh, in US um, study. They started defaulting um, to uh, savings to be 3%. Interestingly, by creating this default, it also reduced the amount that some people were saving because they looked at the default and thought maybe that's sufficient. So with defaults, they can streamline um, processes and result in a better user experience. So maybe in your sign-up forms in your applications, you default certain options so people don't have to go and enter them. But unfortunately, they can also alienate some people. 
and reinforce the existing um, status quo. Be careful with these. If your application maybe defaults to, I don't know, maybe you've got some kind of social um, media application and it defaults to male heterosexual, what are you saying you know, to your users there? I don't know. Let's talk about so-called edge cases. Um, I think many of us um, have at least at some point used Facebook and Facebook had this feature called on this day. And what it did was based on your previous post, maybe a year later or more, it would go and bring up these posts and say, hey, do you remember a year ago, maybe you met or you married someone or maybe it was the birth of your child. And in, at its best, it can be a good reminder of happy events during your life. I don't think it takes too much imagination to think that sometimes there's going to be some things that we don't want to necessarily be reminded about. And unfortunately, here's one example. Um, I'm not sure you'd want to be reminded of that particular situa situation. And I guess this really accumulated um, for a guy called uh, Eric Meyer, who many of you will be familiar with. And he wrote a very thoughtful blog post. And unfortunately, Eric lost his daughter and Facebook decided to bring up this memory in his feed later. And having, you know, re he had recently lost her. So I think we could imagine that maybe he might not want to be reminded of this happy smiling photo. I'm not sure. Facebook later, um, I think, took a better approach to this. And they introduced um, some additional options. And I think these are options that should have been there from the beginning before this feature was released. It is an interesting feature and at its best, it can remind you of some happy occasions when you look back on your life. But having the ability to filter out specific people um, or dates, you know, that probably should have been there from the start. Or, and I think it probably should have been an opt-in feature as well. I'm not sure Eric would have opted into that feature and I'm pretty sure he would have filtered out some specific periods of his life. We've all had that experience where we've been searching for something, Googling for specific products, and you then get these various adverts come up on sites saying, hey, you might be interested in, I don't know, maybe it's some, uh, for me, it, it was a GPS running watch, and it f sort of followed me around on every site that I went to. And unfortunately, Sometimes it contains things that you might not necessarily want to be reminded of. This was an article from um, a few days back, um, and there was a, a lady, she'd been, um, she was pregnant, and she was looking for all sorts of baby products, and unfortunately she lost her baby. But the advertising agencies didn't seem to have, you know, been updated to this. And as she then went around various sites, she was continually reminded of, you know, the baby that was sadly no longer there. And we need to think about these things when we're developing these type of systems. You know, what, what is the worst that could happen? You know, how could this be abused? Interestingly, and I didn't realize this until recently, you can filter out some topics on applications such as Facebook. So I think Facebook have recognized some of the issues around this and you can actually hide um, specific uh, topics. And I think that's a good move. Voice assistance. Uh, there's several options available from some of the major manufacturers, and you know we often you know make use of these. Have you noticed how the default tends to be female? A UN report suggested that maybe this was sort of reinforcing some harmful gender um, stereotypes, and that maybe this wasn't such a good idea. We've all probably had the experience of asking one of these assistants very stupid questions and seeing how it responds. They can be really quite entertaining, some of the silly things that you can go and ask some of these things. But what if you asked Siri, in this example, I don't want to live anymore, and you got this kind of response? Now, it might seem a bit of an odd thing to do, but do we really know how you know someone who's in this you know frame of mind, how they're going to act, what they're going to do? I don't know. There's a video where someone says to Siri, uh, Siri, I want to jump off a bridge. And Siri comes back with directions to the 10 nearest bridges. <laughs> we understand how these failures can happen, but we can do better. And the manufacturers realized this, and they did. 
And if you now go and sort of ask these type of things, um, it will give you some information around some agencies um, and some resources that can you know, help you. They're not very difficult to program and develop these type of um, experiences, but this could save someone's life and make a big difference. So when you're developing your products, consider some extreme cases around some of these things. This is uh, an application um, that's used by the daycare um, place that my kids go to. And um, when you drop the kids off at daycare, you have to electronically sign them in and sign them out. And it also contains some information around photos and descriptions of what they get up to during the day. And it has this security model, which looks a little bit like this. So um, mom and dad um, have a child, one or more child. And the way that particular, this particular system seems to understand that, handle this is you nominate a primary account. And the primary account has full control over some of the things that happen here. So in this uh, example, my ex-wife is the primary account. And in my situation, we have an amicable relationship, so I can say, hey, can you make various changes if I need to? But unfortunately, I don't think this really reflects the complexity of the real world. Because let's take some more examples and say, for example, that mom and dad are no longer together. Maybe dad gets a new partner and they've got a child. And then maybe dad has access to that new child after they get to know each other and are trusted for a bit. And then maybe that new partner has an ex-partner that also needs access to this child. And maybe grandma helps out mom there because she's struggling maybe a little bit. And you can see very quickly that this security model can become quite complex um, indeed, as we need to ensure that the various people who should have access um, to this child's data do, and people that shouldn't, are restricted. And as developers and architects, this can you know, cause something of a headache. But we need to support these type of things. And there could be a tendency to say, well, but just aren't these edge cases you're bringing up here? They're more complicated to implement. They're not the happy path. They're not part of our MVP. Well, they're not edge cases if they apply to you. Let's talk about algorithms. Algorithms, machine learning, AI. Guess what? Your bias and blind spots, if they go into a system or an algorithm, could also produce a bias system with your blind spots. And algorithms can mirror our own biases. Microsoft have a great res resource um, linked down there. And they divide some of the different types of biases into five different types. If you build a model using a data set, which is uh, not diverse enough, you're going to start to um, have some issues with your model. And I'm going to talk an example of that later on. Or maybe in the case of association bias, where you're analyzing existing text, you may find the world is um, that it may have a bias and it assumes that doctors are male based on some of the existing material that's been used as input for these systems. But you might say, well, look, OK, you know, we're starting to see some applications of this. But really, how big an issue is some of this stuff? Well, facial recognition software tends to work really well if you're a white man. Not so well for other groups. This is an example from New Zealand passport system. So for people of uh, Asian descent, um, it would identify them as having their eyes closed. And I think we can assume here that this was developed and tested with probably not as diverse data set as it should have done, and probably not by a team containing um, any people of Asian descent on it. Amazon um, had a uh, recruiting system which would analyze um, various CVs. And they based it on some of the people that were already employed at Amazon. And the problem with the, this was is that Amazon tended to employ a lot of men. And it turned out this also seemed to be a bit biased towards women. Amazon did retire this system. Equivant. So one of the products that Equivant um, produce is they have a uh, model which um, analyzes how likely a criminal is to reoffend. And 
part of the input of this model um, is based on some previous um, statistics and figures. Now, this is an incredibly complex area, but there's rather a lot of research that, you know, maybe there's some racism and bias in the police force, justice system, around these things. ProPublica, an independent organization, found that in one of the systems, the formula was particularly likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals, wrongly labeling them this way at almost twice the rate as white defendants. White defendants were mislabeled as low risk more often than black defendants. Now this system produces a score which is used by the justice system and judges to understand is how likely someone is to go and reoffend. To provide a balanced argument to this, um, the uh, organization responsible for this system, they criticized ProPublica's methodology and defended the accuracy of their test, saying North Point does not agree with the results of your analysis, all the claims being made upon that analysis are correct, or do they accurately reflect the outcomes from the application of the model? I don't know enough about this to judge, but it makes me very uncomfortable that this hasn't been studied further. Eric Holder, a US Attorney General, in 2014 said regarding risk assessments, although these measures were crafted with the best of intentions, I am concerned that they are inadvertently undermine our efforts to ensure individualized and equal justice, he said, adding, they may exacerbate unwarranted and unjust disparities that are already far too common in our criminal justice system and our society. Dating apps. I think this is becoming an increasingly common way people meet. Cornell University in New York found that applications that, used, that let users filter searches by race or relied on algorithms that pair people up of the same race reinforce racial divisions and biases. And taken to its extreme, this could have a very large and very real impact on society itself. Carsten Miller and Carlo Schwartz from the University of Warwick, they looked um, at an area in uh, Germany and they, and they studied um, every anti-refugee attack in Germany, a total of 3,335 uh, 3, over a two year span. And one thing that they found was that towns where Facebook use was higher than average reliably experienced more attacks on refugees. Now, I will say, I, I don't think this is something unique to Facebook. I think this is probably something that's applicable to any sort of social, social media platform. And there's certainly been instances on some other platforms such as WhatsApp and so on. And they found wherever per person Facebook use rose to one standard deviation above the national average, that attacks on refugees would increase by about 50%. That's pretty scary. These systems and solutions that we develop can have a very real influence and impact on people. But there are some things that are starting to improve. And the state of New York introduced the Algorithmic Accountability Act. Um, and this bill required companies to regularly evaluate their tools for accuracy, fairness, bias, and discrimination. There is a question as to how effective this group has been. And you'll find several articles if you go and Google this. But I do think it's a good start where we're starting to get these groups who say, hey, hang on, let's have a look at how these models have been developed and actually analyze you know, some of these things. Preventing abuse. I think many of us are familiar with the uh, somewhat ill-fated Tay. And Tay was a uh, project developed by Microsoft um, as artificial intelligence conversational bot. Um, and Tay would take um, what was uh, spoken to it and use it to construct conversations and so on. Um, unfortunately, the internet being the internet, um, people started feeding it all sorts of horrible stuff. And very quickly, um, Tay started uh, tweeting some rather extremist racist things. And it was uh, subsequently taken offline. I think it was about 16 hours later they had to take it off because some of the stuff it was coming out with was so horrendous. Now, in retrospect, maybe we could have, um, it would have been possible to suggest that, you know, that that might happen and that there are some people that use the internet who um, will do things like that. And there was a tweet by um, some of the alias Unburnt Witch in relation to this. And they said, if you're not asking yourself, how could this be used to hurt someone in your design engineering process, you're fa you failed. So any system and solution you develop 
have a think about this. Facebook, um, they obviously, as a one option Facebook, they make their money um, from uh, adverts and the ability to serve ad adverts to um, people of different attributes and target um, quite, quite specifically. And unfortunately, what occurred um, to uh, some groups is that they could go and use some of these attributes um, to go and run various hate campaigns by targeting people in particular areas and so on. It's not going to be an easy problem to stop that type of thing. Twitter. Twitter at its best can be an awesome way to go and meet people, discussions, links, and so on. But there's been a bit of a history that various sort of abuse maybe hasn't been handled as, as well as it should have done, various things, accounts should have been blocked, and so on. These are not easy problems to fix and resolve, but they do need attention. Neighbors. So there's a system called Ring, um, and uh, it's kind of like an intelligent doorbell thing. So it takes a video of people when you go and um, ring on the doorbell. And behind this, uh, they have a, uh, a system which is kind of a, a social neighborhood watch, if you will, called Neighbors. And one of the things you can do um, on this site is go and post pictures of people that are suspicious. Now, you might imagine where this might be leading. Um, an organization, um, a journalist um, site called Motherboard, they started looking into this um, and they reviewed about 100 of these posts and they found that the majority of people reported as suspicious was people of color. And unfortunately, whilst I don't think that was the original intention behind the people developing you know, some of these things, you could see how some of this could maybe sort of exacerbate existing you know, issues. And you probably need to put some controls in place around this. What starts to become a bit more scary is that um, Ring um, actually work with various police departments across the states. Um, so this could potentially be, you know, sort of spread, you know, even further. One way of potentially looking at some of the threats to your application is the stride model. Um, each letter stands for a potential um, way of attacking an application. So S for spoofing of user identity, T for tampering, R for reputation. I for information disclosure, and D for denial of service, E for elevation of privilege. This isn't going to cover every potential scenario or way that someone could abuse or attack your application, but it can be a good start of thinking, analyzing, take it through a systematic process of how someone might abuse and make use of your application. So what I will say though, is that I would advise, ensure from the very start, that you do have reporting mechanisms and procedures. So if some of these issues do occur, you're not, they don't catch you by surprise. You know, if someone finds some horrendous way to harass people with um, your website, then there is a way for people to go and report this type of thing happening and for you to handle and stop it. Because it's a bit late, you know, if these things occur and you then put in some of these proce procedures and processes in place. I think, Threat assessment frameworks such as Stride, they can also assist um, in some some of the analysis um, of this uh, data. Consider engage in external organisations who also have expertise um, in these uh, particular areas. So some of that maybe is a little bit scary and a bit down and a bit negative. Some of the content. So I also want to talk about some stuff that can help us go and develop and create these applications you know, to ensure that um, we do, they do work for as many people as possible. There's a really great resource um, from uh, the UK government um, at design-systems.gov.uk. Um, and they go and look at various sort of fields um, and uh, systems. And so covering things such as addresses, dates, email addresses, and so on. And they give you advice on how to go and present um, and uh, retrieve this or this information um, from your users. Um, for example, uh, on the uh, home address system here, there's a, a little sort of mini video which talks about what they consider you know, a really good approach or a way of recording um, this type of information. Um, so in this particular example, um, they suggest using a, some type of postal code uh, look up here. And this is extensive and it's continually in development. So if you're wondering, What's the best way to ask a name address? This is a really great resource. 
Uh, the Australian government, they also have a uh, design system. Um, it's got maybe a slightly different focus here um, in that this seems to be sort of more around uh, various different components. And you can reuse some of these components. Um, the HTML and JavaScript is available for some of these things. Um, it's on uh, GitHub. And um, this could serve as a good basis um, for creating accessible and usable applications. It also might save you a little bit of time doing some of this stuff. Microsoft have some really awesome resources around inclusive design. Um, there's a really great um, PDF, um, which come out of the presentation there. And it's about 30 pages um, long or so. And you get this really nice PDF um, here. And this contains a lot of great information, approaches on things you might want to consider, approaches you might want to take when you're designing and developing um, these uh, solutions. I really like um, a particular uh, aspect um, of uh, this. Go back PowerPoint. Um, that gets us to consider, you know, some of these different types of situations, but a range as well. So for example, um, you know, is, is someone distracted while they're driving, but that's only a temporary thing. So when you're creating these situations, you can use these type of um, sort of resources to get you to consider some different things. I quite like this as well. Um, this is a website called um, Perspective Cards, and you just go to the website and um, it will get you to imagine various different uh, situations. So maybe it's something you might want to run at maybe the end of a sprint or something. Um, so imagine your user is in a common law partnership. You know, how are they going to use your application? What's going what's to work for them? What's going to not work so well? And then you can go and click through these and there's all sorts of different scenarios it will get you to think about um, and uh, imagine. Um, Microsoft have a uh, tool called um, Accessibility Insights. It's a free plugin um, available for Chrome and uh, Edge. And this will identify various accessibility uh, issues uh, on your website. A lot of my presentation has been influenced by um, this book. Um, it's called Technically Wrong um, by Sarah Watcher Butcher. And I'm probably completely butchering your name there, so apologies. Um, but this goes into a lot more detail um, about some of the uh, situations, um, some of the failures and stuff that I've covered today. And I'd really suggest this is a great resource to start understanding um, more about this particular area. And I don't think this is an area we can afford to ignore. So in summary, do you consider your own biases and blind spots? Because we absolutely all have them. Work with a diverse team and users. And do imagine extreme use cases. As developers and designers, we are in a great position to change this. We really can have an influence on these applications and systems. It doesn't matter if you're an intern. You know, if you see something that doesn't look right or isn't going to work or is potentially excluding or discriminating against a particular person, raise this, let people know about it. And what I'd like to end on is a advert that Microsoft ran um, during the uh, Super Bowl. And some of you might have seen um, this campaign before. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen. And I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like, oh, do, 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 do. She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. 
What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. And the point I wanted to leave you with is whilst there's certainly economic incentives to be developing your solutions and applications. Oh, you get a wider audience, more customers, more people using it. It's also the right thing to do. And that if we do this, come on PowerPoint. <laughs> when everybody plays, we all win. And I think that's a nice point to end on here. Some resources if you want to learn more about this area, and it's a massive area. Thank you very much. free to uh, go speak to me or ping me and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you.